Well, good morning. good morning. Got a question I want to ask you. Has, has there ever been something in your life that you felt like you needed or you wanted, but you didn't follow through with it, you didn't move through because you didn't think either you were capable or you didn't think you deserved it? Yes. I think all of us at some point have gone through something like that. And I, I, I began to think through what were some of those moments. And it's sad, one of the one moment that rose up to me, which really has no significance to life whatsoever, except it's a reality, is when I was young, there was this girl I wanted to, I wanted to go with, and I don't know where we were going to go, but I wanted to, to go with her, and, uh, and I realized that she was above my pay grade. I mean, she, there was no possible ways, and something had been spoken into me that made me think that that was not the truth. And so I didn't ask her to go with me. And then I get to be married to Marcy for 30 years. So that was a win. Um, so I, I don't know what in your life that may be. But as I continued to think about this, I thought of another circumstance where maybe there was a, a small basketball team from a, a small school where at the beginning of the season, they said they would, they would rank seventh in, in the Big 12. And, and then all of a sudden, they end up in the national championship game. And who knows, they may be national champions this year, Texas Tech, go Raiders. Anyway, so um, if you don't know, that's where I graduated from. That's where Marcy graduated from. Somebody asked me this morning why I didn't have a double T on my shirt. And the truth is that one of our, our children, our son, went to LSU. And what happens is where your money goes, that's where a lot of your loyalty goes as well. And so I, I have more LSU stuff now than I do Texas Tech stuff. I started looking through my Texas Tech stuff and I said, I got nothing. I got nothing. So I wore black. Anyway, so today we're going we're gonna to look at a story in the book of Mark as we continue to walk through the book of Mark, really understanding and trying to figure out who Jesus is, and trying to remind ourselves of who Jesus is, we're going to look at a story of a man who was at a place in his life that he didn't think he deserved it. He didn't think he was worth it. He didn't, something in his life had brought him to that point of not, of not realizing that he had that worth in him. And so I want us to look at his story, but I want us to see who Jesus is in this story all the more. So let's look at this. It's found in the book of Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 30, uh, 46. And this is what the Word of God says. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And so throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight, and he followed him on the way. So it's really important for us to kind of get a context of what's going on here. The first thing is, in the book of Mark, the, the gospel writers wrote their particular gospels, the good news, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They wrote them with a purpose. They wrote them with the intent to get people to understand who Jesus is and to give them a, a space to be able to accept Jesus as their Lord. And so Mark chose this story. Now, the interesting thing is this is the last miracle in the book of, uh, the last healing, the last miracle in the book of Mark. And I'm kind of curious why this story? Because there were probably other people who got healed, but Mark chose this one right before Jesus enters into Jerusalem and goes to give up his life. Mark chose this story. And so the second thing that we need to look in this story is the fact that Mark is, is kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version of Gospels. He wants to get through it. He, he's kind of moving. He uses the word he uses the word immediately all the time. So it's immediately this, immediately this, immediately this. And so there's this expectation that Mark's just kind of running through it. But in this story, Mark remembers a name. It's, it's a rarity in the book of Mark that he names the blind man. So that's really important for us to see. So what we have is we have Jesus and the disciples, and it says a large crowd, and they're leaving Jericho, and they're coming out of Jericho, and they're going to Jerusalem. 
And it says, as they exit out of Jericho, then on the side of the road is a guy named Bartimaeus. Now what's happening is everyone is going up to Jerusalem for Passover. Everyone's going up for this high season, this high day of, of the Jewish culture. And so there are thousands of people. And if you look at a map, if you look at uh, a, an image of what that road looks like, it is a narrow road. It's not this wide road, this wide expanse where you have thousands of people, but it's this narrow space. And so you have these thousands of people that are winding out of Jericho and winding their way up to Jerusalem. It's kind of like being in, a, in an airport where there are tons of people all around you and there's all this noise and all this chaos and the speakers are going off and they're calling this flight and they're calling this flight or it's kind of like a subway uh, setting. If, if you've been down the subway when during, during high traffic time, there are tons of people and it's really loud and it's really noisy. That's kind of the setting of what's going on with Jesus right now. He's among thousands of people, tons of noise, lots of chaos, lots of things going on, dust rising up from the ground with these thousands of people. And so that's the setting that they see this man named Bartimaeus on the side of the road. Now, it's important for us to know who Bartimaeus is. Bartimaeus, as Mark says, is the son of Timaeus. But the important thing to, for us to understand about that is the word Timaeus means highly prized or honorable. And so you have this son who's a blind man who's sitting beside the road, who's begging for his sole existence. He's begging from other people just to be able to live, be able to exist. And so he's from this family called the highly prized or the honorable. Does it look like at all that he is sitting in a place where he feels highly prized or he feels honorable? And my question to you is there are some of us that are sitting in this room and some of us who are living in that place are going, I don't feel highly prized. I don't feel honorable. I don't feel that worth in me. And there are multiple people throughout our culture and possibly in this space that don't understand how highly prized and honorable they are. And that's where Bartimaeus is. And so before we move on any further, I just want to say this to you, that you are highly prized. And you are honorable because the God of all creation has breathed his very life into you. He has placed his image. We're told in Genesis that he placed his image in us, that we have the image of the living God in us. And so you are prized. You are honorable. You are worthy just because of who you are in Christ, not because of what you do, not because of what you have, not because of anything that you have surrounding you, just because you are his. Man, that's where we need to live. But there are a lot of people who don't live there. They don't live in that place. And Bartimaeus isn't living in that place. And so when, when Bartimaeus hears that Jesus of Nazareth is coming by, then Bartimaeus is sitting, sitting there thinking, here's my chance. And so Jesus walks by with this chaos, with all these people around. Jesus walks by and Bartimaeus begins to scream out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then it says people tried to rebuke him and tried to shut him up. And it says he got all the louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And if you're in this place today, if you're at that state where you're just like, I'm not really sure I'm worthy of it. I'm not really sure that I, can, I, that I deserve this. I was sitting with my dad one time. It was toward the end of his life. And we were talking through some things that he had done. And I said, Daddy, you realize that Jesus forgives you for that. And he looked at me and he said, no, I don't deserve that. There's some of us that are sitting in this room right now. That it may be because of something that you've done. It may be because of something that, that has been said to you. It may, be, it may be voices that have spoken into you that said, this is who you are. And so you're sitting in a place going, I don't deserve that. I'm not worthy of that. I just want to remind you, you are highly prized and you are worthy and you are honorable because God has created you as such. It's something that you need to embrace. It's something that you need to be aware of. And when you're at that place of questioning that and wondering about that, where do you turn? You see, there are tons of voices in our world that want to, that want to dictate and tell us who we are and what we are. It's just like the song said, I'm all you said that I am. That's who I am. 
I'm who Jesus says I am. I'm not who the world says I am. And yet there are times in my life that I continue to turn myself over to the world and go, what, world, what do you tell me I am? Instead of living in the fact that I am highly prized, I'm honorable before my God. That is the truth. And I've got to be real honest with y'all. There are times, and this probably isn't going to catch, catch any of y'all off guard. There are times in ministry that I'm just sitting here going, Am I, making any, am I making any difference? Am I, am I worthy of this? And I'm not telling you this to say, oh gosh, I feel so sorry for you. I'm just telling you that we all go through this. We all go through this questioning, this wondering. Is this having any impact? Do I have any influence? Do I have any purpose in this life whatsoever? We've got a friend of ours who was involved in our ministry up at Tech, and he has recently uh, come out on Facebook. He, he's been going through depression a significant part of his life. And he got to the place of beginning to wonder, well, maybe this world is better without me. And luckily, luckily there was a seed in the back of his head that said, no, no. I know who I am. And so he went to his wife, and, he, and this is what he said. Three very difficult words. I need help. And so he sought help, and he got help. And he's putting it out on Facebook, telling other people, listen, you don't have to live in this depression because here's the thing. There are Bartimaeuses that are sitting on the side of the road, and they're not crying out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. In the core of their being, in the quietness of their life, and their heart, they are. And there's some of us that look like we got everything together. We look like that we've, we've got everything in place. But in truth, inside, it's chaotic. It's messed up. There's so, many, there's so many wounds and so many open wounds and, and things that need to be healed. And so we're crying out inside, but we don't cry out outwardly because the times that we've done that, other people haven't responded well or they've responded poorly to us. Come on, get over it. What are you doing? Come on. Seriously, you think that about yourself? Yeah, I do. So Bartimaeus is sitting over here, but he's crying out loud. But there's something really important to see in what Bartimaeus cries out. He doesn't cry out, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus, have mercy on me. Because as it said, he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming by. There were a lot of people that were following Jesus because he was a good teacher. There were a lot of people following Jesus because he was a rabbi. And what he was teaching sounded kind of good. And there are people in our world and in our culture that say they're following Jesus because they're like, yeah, I like what he teaches and it's good stuff. But no, Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, somewhere within Bartimaeus' history and past, he heard who Jesus was. And he heard that Jesus was the Messiah that was prophesied back in Isaiah, saying that the son of David was going to come and was going to set us free. The son of David was going to come and deliver us. The son of David was going to come and, and forgive us for our sins and make us into who he created us to be. You see, what, what Bartimaeus knew is that Jesus was the son of David. David. Do you know that Jesus is the son of David? Is that the one you cry out to? Is that the one you serve? Is that the one you follow? Or do you just follow this kind of good teacher that kind of fits in with every other teacher? It's a hodgepodge. It's a buffet of of good quotes that you can put on your Facebook. Is that the kind of Jesus you follow? Or do you follow Jesus who says that I am the son of David? I am the living God and I'm the one who came to save you. Without me, you don't have any hope. Because that's the Jesus that Bartimaeus cries out to. And that's the Jesus that we need to be crying out to. You see, we don't need to be crying out to this Jesus that is just man. We need to be crying out to Jesus who is fully God and fully man and came and gave his life for you and I. So as we walk through this story, we see this part of Bartimaeus, but then this amazing, beautiful moment happens in the story. And it says, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. I want to remind you what the context is. Thousands of people that are around. Chaos, noise, voices. But there's another part of this story that we haven't talked about. 
It's the fact that Jesus knew where he was going. Can you imagine what was weighing heavily on Jesus' mind that he knew that he was going to be mocked, beaten, and killed? That he was going to that? Y'all, there are people, there, there are those of us in this room that we don't stop for anybody just because of our busy schedules. And this man knows that he is going to give his life for the sake of humanity, and he stops. Man, that should tell us something about who God is. You see, when you and I are crying out, whether outwardly or whether within ourselves, when we are crying out, God stops for you. Jesus hears your voice above all the cacophony, above all the noises. Jesus hears your voice. I can tell you that there were times in, in our lives where our kid, when our kids were younger that we're in this space. We're in this space with a lot of people. And yet when our kids got lost, when they couldn't see us because they're down here and we're up here, when they couldn't see us and they cried out, I can tell you which voice was my kid's voice. And Jesus stops for you. Why? Because you're highly prized. Because you're honorable. You see what was going through Jesus' mind. It had to be going through Jesus' mind was this. And I think this is the reason, and I'm presuming, but I think this is the reason that Mark chose this story. Because Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem. And in the very act and the nature of him going to Jerusalem, he is saying to not only Bartimaeus, but to everyone and to all of humanity, the reason I'm going is because you're highly prized. The reason I'm going is because you're worth it. I will stop for you. I will hear you. So it says Jesus stopped and he called him. And he looks at the disciples and he said, call him over here. So the disciples, the, one that, the ones that we can assume were rebuking him and telling him to be quiet. They go over to Bartimaeus and they're like, hey. The man's calling you. We tried to shut you up, but we'll, we'll, we'll send you over to him. So it says he stood up and he took his cloak and he cast off his cloak. And it says he made his way to Jesus. Now, I got to tell you all that I've read this story many, many times. I've taught on this story many, many times. And I have to tell you this time as I'm reading it, I'm thinking that, that he gets up, throws his cloak away and runs to Jesus. But I forget the fact that he's blind. I mean, he's, he's making his way to Jesus. I think Mark was very intentional about using that language. Making his way. Bumping into people. Creating a little, a little discomfort in the process. When we lived in Ruston, there was a center for the blind up in Ruston. When we moved there, man, my heart was broken because I saw all these blind students walking around with their canes. I hadn't been around that many blind students ever in my life. And they're walking around with their canes, and they're bumping into poles, and they're bumping into cars, and they're bumping into all these things. My heart was just breaking for them. I'm like, could someone not tell them there's a car there? I mean, I had this one guy. He stopped in front of the Wesley Foundation, and he had his cane, and he was just doing this. He was going around in circles, and I walked down. I said, can I help you? And he goes, no, you can't. And I'm like, what? He said, this is part of my schooling. And if you help me, then I can't figure out how to get out of this. See, Bartimaeus knew that he had to get to Jesus. And as I'm thinking through this, I'm wondering, did the disciples help him? Because the disciples tried to shut him up. The disciples tried to rebuke him. Did they help him get to Jesus? But he got to Jesus. And then Jesus, being, being who Jesus is, he looks at him and just embraces him and loves him. And, ah, oh, come here, bring it in. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> he said, what do you want me to do for you? Do you realize that when you and I get to Jesus and when we're crying out and when Jesus says, come here, do you realize that he'll ask you, what do you, what do you want me to do for you? Because the answer to, our, to that question reveals and reflects our heart. 
You see, if you were here last week with us, when James and John came to Jesus and said, hey, hey, Rabbi, we want you to do what, what we're going to ask. And Jesus said, okay, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, we want to have positions on your right and your left. We want positions of authority. We want positions of power. We want, we want to be with you in your kingdom. So he looks at this blind man who ironically sees Jesus better than the religious leaders see Jesus. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, I just want my sight restored. Do you see what desperation does? Desperation gets you to this base level of going, man, I just, I just need you. Or I just need my sight restored. I don't, I don't care about positions of power and authority. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about material possessions. I don't care about all this. Just, I, I just want to see. I just want to see. When you're standing present with Jesus, when you're with Jesus, and I hope that you're making space in your week to be with Jesus, but when you are, and when you're with him, and he asks you the question, what do you want me to do for you? What's your answer? Because that reveals your heart. It also reveals who you know Jesus to be. So Jesus looks at him and says, your faith has healed you. Go. And it says that he, remo- he received his sight immediately. But then it says that he followed him. Now, what's interesting to me is a lot of us, we would receive our sight and we'd just want to go tell everyone. We would go, want to go to our family and say, oh man, I got my sight back. But it, it says that he immediately received the sight and he followed Jesus. Is that your heart? Whenever you encounter the living God, when you encounter Jesus, when Jesus steps into your life, not only in saving you from your sin, but when he steps into your life and provides for you and meets your needs, do you just, does it draw you closer and closer and closer? Do you just keep going, man, I am behind you. I want to step in your footprints. That's how behind you I want to be. Or do you just forget? It's like, I got it. Thanks. Going to move on with my life not what Bartimaeus did. The last beautiful thing about Bartimaeus is it says that he stood up and he took off his cloak and he cast it to the side. The in front of himself and his people give their money and give alms to him because it was natural in the Jewish tradition to give to one who was begging to one in need. And so he had this cloak that clearly had things in it, but he took that and he cast it to the side. And it's this beautiful picture saying, that's not who I am anymore. I'm not going to live under that. I'm not going to let that define me anymore. And so there's some of us that are sitting in this room that have had things spoken over us, spoken into us. We've been told that we are certain things. We've been told that we, that we deserve certain things. And I just want to tell you in Jesus, because you are highly prized and because you are honorable, that's not who you are anymore. Paul talks about it. He says, anyone in Christ is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so I just want to encourage you this morning. In fact, some of you need to do it this morning. Take the cloak, which wants to find you and throw it away and say, that is not who I am anymore. I am in Christ, honorable, highly prized. It's who I am. And we live like that. We walk with that certainty. So some of you may be sitting here going, yeah, I don't really struggle with that. I don't struggle with questioning who I am and what I am. I know I'm pri- highly prized. I know, uh, I know I'm honorable. And my question at, at that point would be just to ask you to be honest with yourself and say, you're highly prized and honorable in Jesus or you're highly prized and honorable because of what you've accomplished or what you've done. But if you are honestly at that place of going, I know who I am in Jesus, then there's a role and responsibility in this passage for you. And it's this. Jesus looked at the disciples and said, go get him. And they went to him and they said, get up, be of good courage He's calling you. Y'all, you and I have the responsibility to step into the lives of the people around us because we know who we are in Christ. We know we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. So we have the responsibility to go to other people and say, He's calling you. 
Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you to himself. He wants to speak and declare those same things over you. He wants to restore you. He wants to remake you. He wants to revive you. He wants to save you. He wants to rescue you. Jesus is calling you. Do you have, do you have it in you? Is it your desire and your passion to go out and to tell other people, he's calling you? I was convicted when I was preparing this message because I'm like, do I do that enough? Do I let people know enough that Jesus loves them so passionately that he's calling them to himself, that he stops for them, that he hears them? Do I love them enough to be able to declare that to them? Y'all, that's our calling is to go to other people and say, he's calling you. Are you speaking that into other people? Just within the last month, I've been incredibly convicted with the fact that we need to do that most importantly in the lives of our kids. We need to be going to our children going, do you know that Jesus is calling you? Do you know who you are? Do you realize what has been invested in you, what has been placed in you? The very worth of God is in you. We stood out here and we baptized, uh, remembered baptisms and baptized some kids last week. Wish the weather would have been like today, last week, but it wasn't. But we are not only called to speak this into our children, our blood. We are called to speak this into the children that are throughout this community, the children that you encounter throughout your life. You are called to speak this and declare this and say to these kids, hey, Jesus is calling you to every child that you meet. It doesn't matter who they are because they need to know. They need to know that Jesus stops for them. They need to know that Jesus loves them. They need to know that Jesus cares for them. And you know one of the greatest ways that that can happen is through you. It's to go to them and say, Jesus is calling you. Man, I'm with you. If you see a child around here, just walk up, give them a high five, give them a hug, speak truth over to them, over them. Just tell them something about who they are, not about what they wear. Not about what they do. Because just like for you and I, our worth is not found in what we do and what we make and everything like that. Our worth is found in Jesus. Just like with a child, their worth is not found in how they do in the classroom. Their work is not found in how they do in their club. Their work is not found in how they do in their sports. Their worth is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what we have to speak into our kids. Are you speaking that into them? I encourage you, find a child, find a young adult before you walk out of here and just say, I just want you to know that Jesus has stopped for you, that you have worth. And some kids, it's going to freak them out. (laughs) You know, what are you doing? But there's some younger kids that you can walk up and you can just kind of give a little hug to or touch them on the shoulder and just say, man, you're worth everything. And there's some kids here that are scared to death of me. (laughs) And they won't come to me. There's one in particular. She was here in the first service. She intentionally turns away from me. I'll look at her and call her by name and she'll go. but I caught her downstairs (laughs) and she was talking to Marcy. I kissed her on the head. Man, you should have seen the look she gave me. (laughs) But here's the thing. I promise you, if she's around here, she's going to know that she is loved by me and loved by Jesus. I promise you that. We need to be breathing that into not only our kids, but into one another. Do you encourage each other? Do you speak that into each other? Do you look at one another and say, man, Jesus is calling you that you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God. That is a truth. That is a reality. Whether you know it, whether you live it, whether you embrace it. We all need to hear that. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. When our kids were younger, Marcy would be driving them to school, and she'd say, who are you? And Austin said, I'm Austin Hunter Wright. 
son of Scott and Marcy Wright, son of the Most High God. We look at Bailey and say the same thing. Bailey, who are you? I'm Bailey Marie Wright, daughter of Scott and Marcy Wright, daughter of the Most High God. That's who you are. I just feel like some of you are Bartimaeus standing, sitting beside the road right now. You're crying out. You're, you're, you're crying out for, for something from someone. And I just want to tell you that Jesus has stopped for you. He sees you. He hears you. And he's calling out for you. going to move into communion and remember Jesus going to the cross going to Jerusalem reflects your worth and reflects how highly prized you are so as you take part in communion today recognize that that's in you it's available to you so let's pray God thank you for your word Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the story of Bartimaeus. Thank you that we're able to look at his life and realize that we are highly prized and that we are honorable in your sight. I pray for anyone in this room who is living in that place of really not feeling that and who is crying out audibly or crying out through their actions or crying out internally and they have a silent cry inside just going, would somebody just see me? God, I pray that you would show them that they, they have been seen, that you stopped for them. I pray, God, that as you restore us, as you save us, as you heal us, I pray that we would follow you closer. I pray that we would come up behind you and cannot get close enough to you in following you. And I pray that we won't allow the other voices to, to dictate and to define who we are, but we will allow your voice and your voice alone to do that. And I pray that as we take part in communion, that we would remember that the very nature by which you gave your life reveals to us that we are highly prized and we are honorable. Thank you for speaking that into us. Thank you for declaring that over us. And thank you for calling us to live in that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.